Dilly, welcome back to the podcast. It's been a while. How are you doing? Thank you very much for having me, Alex. It's been been amazing, mate. It's been an incredible journey so far since our last chat. Yeah. So last time we spoke about the product Toxin Prevent, and we talked about histamine and sort of histamine intolerance, histamine metabolism and detoxification. But today we're going to be diving into vitamin D. Um, we were just talking off air that actually there's a little segue maybe into talking about histamine from a vitamin D perspective. But I guess um, to set the scene, are you happy maybe just to do a little bit of a high level introduction into vitamin D? A lot of people are obviously aware that it's important to supplement throughout the majority of the year in the UK. Um, but most people, I guess, think about it primarily from an immune perspective, for example. Um, so are you happy to just sort of break it down a little bit and then we'll we'll go into some of the finer details? Yeah, yeah, happily. Um the thing is where do you begin with vitamin D <laughs> like you 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 start the conversation like oh should we talk about the sunshine should we talk about supplementation and it's uh I think it all boils down to the fact of where it's uh, how it activates in the system I think the most important part for me is, is like vitamin D synthesis and we've kind of been told this story of like if you go into the sun for two weeks, you've got enough vitamin D for the rest of the year. Or we've been told if you get vitamin D in the sun in, in the summer, you don't need it in the winter. And I think that's just not true for us in the UK. Like I think the main point is is like for anyone that's north of the um of the the equator, our vitamin D levels are like so so low. I think the last time I read a report, they said about ninety percent of anyone above the north equator had deficiency. Ninety percent. Wow. That's crazy. That's that's like crazy figures. And, you know, we have people don't understand that the vitamin D binding proteins and how they work in the system. So should we start with the sunshine? Should we explain yes. how the sunshine works? So go for it. So we have UVA rays and UVB rays and it's UVB rays is what we need. And the only time we can get UVB rays is between 12 and two. After that, it's just UVA rays and you're just topping up on your tan. So people think like at 4 p.m. if they're sitting in the sun lounging out having a glass of wine, you're getting the sun, you're getting vitamin D. You're really not. You're just tanning. And so UV UVB rays hit the skin, and when they hit the skin, they bind with cholesterol, and cholesterol sits into the into the surface of the skin, and that binds to the vitamin D. And then you have these they're called vitamin D binding proteins. That then gets pulled in to the liver. And when it's in the liver, it goes through a process called hydroxylation, where it's convert, converted from cold calciferol to calcifidiol. And calcifidiol is the, the precursor to calcitriol. Now, to convert from calcitri sorry, calcifidiol to calcitriol, it's a lot of trials I know, <laughs> you have to go into the kidneys, and then the kidneys rehydroxylate it, and then it gets optimized. But what happens is when vitamin D hits that skin, your adipose tissues, especially if you're deficient, will pull that vitamin D in. So before it's even got to the calcitriol, you actually haven't activated it. And you're actually losing a lot of that vitamin D in that hydroxylation process. Because if you're deficient, your body's like, well, listen, you're not getting vitamin D much. I need to store this. I need to store this in the tissues. And we know we now know that, and we can say it quite clearly, vitamin D is a hormone. It's a hormone our body needs. And I think... There's a lot of confusion about how that vitamin D from the sunshine works. And the thing is, did you know, and this is factual, you can you can read all the research, I'll send you all the papers, that if you stand in the sun between, like I say, like a rule of thumb, like from zero to 10 minutes, you will absorb around about 10,000 I use of vitamin D, 10,000. Okay. And then if you stand it for 20 minutes, it's 20,000, 30 minutes, 30,000. And it takes about 30 minutes for the skin to burn. So you, you've got half an hour is a lot of time. So if, you, if you're if you inputting 10,000 IUs, what makes you think supplementing 4,000 IUs is enough vitamin D? Mm -hmm. That's crazy, right? You just think like just, just think about that, that narrative. But the issue is, is this, and this is the big, big one, is 10,000 IUs is enough vitamin D for one day that's your minimum level for one day that's not for the winter that's just for that one day <laughs> so to think that you stand in the sun on monday and go i've got enough vitamin d from this from the from the sun then is bollocks it is it just doesn't make sense and the thing is people think that taking the sunshine is enough but Vitamin D is a hormone. Your body utilizes it. Your, your immune system utilizes it. You need a vitamin D to link the innate and adaptive immune system. And that vitamin D is what kind of 
brings that link in you know, making sure that you're adapting to viruses and colds and bacteria, and it's being used up. So do you think getting sunshine on a Monday is enough to to like work for the rest of the summer? No, because it's being used up every single day. So vitamin D, and I can't stress this enough, should be taken every single day. Whether you're in the sun or you're not, you should be supplementing vitamin D. Okay, that's interesting. And, you know, I guess in some ways goes against, as you say, some of what we might hear in regards to supplementation. Um, so I guess, you know, you've touched on sort of the metabolism and the breakdown of vitamin D. Um which I think is really important for people to understand yeah. because, you know, you what you've mentioned there already starts to indicate that there are some key considerations when we think around forms of supplementation and things like this. So do you, do we need to kind of dive a little bit deeper into that or where do we go from here in regards to sort of the metabolism and the impact that has? I mean, there is like, an argument around about genetic snips and vitamin D and not getting enough of it. And so some people can't tolerate cold calciferol supplements. And so we do, you know, we need sometimes to look at other forms of it. So I know we have like injections into the skin and people like, you know, do the vitamin D injections. I know a couple of companies like get a drip doing, you know, really, really massively around it. And there's other things like, you know, taking liposomal vitamin Ds and sprays. I know better you do a spray vitamin mm. D, which is just, you know, they've done really, really well in the vitamin D community. And the thing is, like, cold calciferol is great, but a lot of people, like, you know, we when we do when we do testing, we'll test people's levels. And we, we used to do all these, like, events and stuff, Alex, and I'd have clinicians come up to me and they'll be like, oh, can I get my vitamin D tested? Because, you know, we've got our, you know, 15-minute rapid vitamin D test. And we would test them and the results would be on the floor. They'd be at like, you know, seven, you know, seven or 10 nanomoles, oh, wow. 30 nanomoles. And they'll be like, and we got called, we got called frauds. They said, you're, you're they're like, Dilly, your, your test doesn't work. That's, that's bullshit. <laughs> and I'll be like, oh, okay, okay. How, how much vitamin are you supplementing? And they'd be like, oh, 4,000 IU. And I'll be like, well, it, your body needs, you need 10,000 IU per 70 kilos of body weight to push your blood level up by 2.5 nanomole. So 2.5 nanomole, which is one nanogram. So if you're taking 4,000 IU, you're not even touching that that area. And so when you look at the cold calciferol supplementation, it's not that cold calciferol is bad, or it's just that you're not getting enough. You're not getting enough of that vitamin D, and your body's also utilizing that vitamin D. And so that's where kind of like our journey began into like calciferol. And as I explained, cold calciferol becomes calciferol. And that conversion is really, really important. But as I was saying, the adipose tissues, we now know this, that the research is there, the adipose tissues pulling that vitamin D in. And so before it can even be converted into calciferol, it's already been used up. So when you actually get converted to calcitriol, which is the active form, that's not lasting, you know, that's not, there's not enough of it in there. So you're not actually feeling the benefits. So you're taking this vitamin D and all you do is just make an expensive, you're just purchasing vitamin D and just taking it willy nilly. You need to be, you know, consistent taking a minimum of 10,000 IUs. And so that's where kind of like my journey came into calciferdiol, into like the history of it. I don't know if you want to hear, do you want to hear the history of how I got into calciferdiol? Yeah, please. So like that, I, that's that smile suggests there's a story there. <laughs> oh, there's a, there's a story there. So like, uh, you know, every everything has a story, right? And everyone's has a story. Like, you know, like if you talk to any clinician, you'll say, why did you become a clinician? And they'll be like, because my journey in health, da, 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 da. Like I had this health problem and I wanted to fix it or my kid had this health problem. And so like, I kind of sat with vitamin D and, and one of my friends who passed away, Dr. Lars von Olesik, uh, shout out to him, one of the greatest vitamin D doctors I ever, ever met. He he um he introduced me to vitamin D, and I was looking at cold calciferol. And when we bought the vitamin D test, like the rapid vitamin D test, I was sat, and um one of the industry pioneers said to me, and I won't name him just in case. He said to me, he "Goes Dilly, I think you're missing a trick here. You, you you know why are you offering the rapid test but not bringing a vitamin D supplement out?" And I was just like, "Yeah, I don't want to because there's so many out." And then as I kind of like learned about what I said there. I started looking at like the forms of vitamin D and I started looking at the history of vitamin D and that kind of blew my mind a little bit when I started looking at the history of like sanatoriums. I don't know if you've ever heard of sanatoriums before. Yeah, I think so. But yeah, expands. 
so sanatoriums were called light therapy healing centers and you had um so you had baniotherapy, heliotherapy, which yeah. is like you know, sea salt therapy, so salt water. Then it was like air therapy, so like getting oxygen into the system. And in 19, the 1920s, if you look at the history of vitamin D, sanatoriums were set up all across like the world. There were some really good ones in Sweden. That's why Sweden are known for like their health and in Germany as well. But in the UK, in 1928, we used to have these sanatoriums. One of them was actually where, I'm, where, I'm, where, I'm, where I live, which is like Royal Lemton Spa. They used to have like this, they had like, used to have this healing, they called it healing water. Wow. And it was water that was mineralized and people would come. And in the summer, you would dip yourself into the water, remineralize. And as we know, a cofactor of vitamin D is you need magnesium and K2 and boron. So they dip themselves into the water and the magnesium would leach into their skin. And then they would stand in the sunshine between 12 and 2. They would be doing activities like yoga. They'd be stretching. Kids would be playing games. And you'd be getting that lovely sunshine into your skin. Therefore, like things like rickets disease were being treated. And so that history kind of came out and I was like, this is crazy. They, they've actually, they, they were doing that 1928, but now we're told you, you can't be in the sun for too long because of skin cancer. Mm. I understand that. I get the science. I get the rule, like the, the, I get the, you know, the, the synthesis by it. But what they didn't say was that you needed, you could stand in the sun for up to 30 minutes. And that's what like blew my mind. And so I thought to myself, okay, so we, we're not allowed to stand in the sun without, without putting like literally cone ourselves with SPF 50 you literally you know SPF 50 is one of the biggest sold products so but then people go to the sunshine be like I'm getting my vitamin D you're not if you're wearing anything above a skin factor of 10 you're actually not taking any vitamin D into the skin because it's blocking it out and then I looked at cold calciferol supplements and I thought okay so cold calciferol is the biggest one around and then one of my contacts rang me and they said Dilly I need to introduce you to someone I said okay who is it and it's his name's James Duan and I said, okay, cool. Let me introduce to him. And I met and got introduced to like this, this, what was a researcher. And I want to call him professor because he is a professor, but he's just, he just, he's a businessman who just like, he was doing research years and years ago. So 25 years ago now, his company created calcifidal supplementation. Huh. And I'll tell you why they did it for. It was because of pigs, cows, and chickens. So, you know, when mass manufacturing food came about, mm. you know, you watch, I don't know if you watch all the Netflix series on like, you know, like the, the cowspiracy theories and stuff where they're like they're putting cows into like the massive containers, containers and breeding them. But what was happening, these chickens and cows were getting rickets disease and they were like getting bone deficiencies and they knew it was because of vitamin D. But the problem was they couldn't risk getting cold calciferol into calcifidon into calcitriol they couldn't get to calcitriol because they didn't know how toxic it could be because we've been told there's like level of toxicity and so he said like what can we do and they realized that you could get you could convert to calcifidiol and what they did was they started giving these animals calcifidol so they they created de demosterol and they pulled the vitamin d out of it created calcifidol and started giving it to these animals. And would you need, would you believe the bone density deficiency stopped? They started getting stronger. So they realized that they needed to also use the vitamin D and they didn't tell this to anyone for viruses because they know that vitamin D had plays a role in, in bacteria and viruses. So they knew that vitamin D, you know, impacted the immune system. So 25 years ago, Monsanto came in and what did they do? Bought them out. Uh, you know, literally written them a check and said we're buying you out and they the, the the technology got brought into the food food chain and they were putting that into the feed for the animals yeah. and they were giving you know vitamin d to the animals so calcifidol was told that it was for animal consumption so their vitamin d is optimized and do you know like these mushrooms that have got vitamin d into them or like the steak with vitamin d and the eggs with vitamin d that's james's research he's the guy that did that that's his that's wow. his data and then <laughs> He came to me and he was like, Dilly, what's your interest in calcifidol? And I said, I'm getting told about these genetic snips and people not getting enough vitamin D. And people like, you know, like you're you're in your house and as people know, you're a dad. So how much time do you get in the sun? Barely anything. Yeah. I'm stuck in my office. I'm stuck at home with my, my little one. So we don't get in the sun. And so I said, if you're taking cold calciferol, but not getting enough of it, you're stuck to the 4,000 I use, then how could we make it better? And he said... I'll give you calcifidiol. So I started arguing with different people, started doing my research, got into the data of it. 
got the safety data, proved that it was completely safe for human consumption. And then that's how vitamin D became about. We created vitamin D as calcifediol. And when we ran the tests and the studies, we actually showed when you took vitamin D as calcifediol, you increased vitamin D levels by 3.2 times. So your vitamin D levels would just rapidly go up. And the reason being is because it, it, circumvented the liver to go directly into the kidneys where it became hydroxylated into calcitriol and when it became mm -hmm. calcitriol your vitamin d levels came up and you felt the benefits how cool is that that's brilliant and that is a really good story i love i always love hearing like the the background the history because so much has gotten gotten lost ultimately hasn't it um you know i've heard i've certainly heard of heliotherapy before um, and, you know, you often see some of those posts on social media around how we used to use sunshine a lot more than we now do. And as you've said, a lot of people are scared by the sun these days because of what we're told. Um, so thank you for giving us kind of the, the backstory as well. I think one of the big things for me that's come out from that, Dilly, is is actually the complexity within vitamin D um, supplementation. And it's obvious, you know, the general public is certainly going to just think that they can take their vitamin D at the recommended dose and all will be well. But you've mentioned here genetic predispositions around the transport and sort of cellular receptor sensitivity to vitamin D that might influence the dose that's required. Uh, you've mentioned the cofactors like magnesium, K2 and boron. Um, you've mentioned how body fat is like a, a reservoir ultimately that is going to have a big impact, I guess, on sort of the dose that's required. Um, so as a result of that, I guess, personalizing someone's dosage and understanding what that is, is a, you know, an important part to this. And you've mentioned the rapid vitamin D test. Um, can you just, I guess, for our practitioners, maybe just shed a little bit more light on that? Where is it? How can they get hold of it? Because having a test that you can do in clinic that after 15 minutes is going to give your clients readings is an incredibly helpful bit of kit. Um, and then I know off air, we mentioned around sort of your um, your kind of equation, for want of a better word, that kind of helps us understand what the dose may be based on our client's data. Um, so it'd be great to kind of unpick that a bit more. Yeah. Oh, uh, thank you for bringing that up, Alex. Um, so the vitamin D testing was quite interesting. Like I said before, Dr. Lars von Olesik, he he's the guy that ignited my what like needed to vitamin d because uh, i would i'll tell you the funny story I, how i got introduced to that vitamin d d test machine was i was sat in a bar in germany and lars pulled this out we were just sat because we we have like our annual yearly meetings and stuff and we were sat down and he tested my vitamin d levels and when he tested them i didn't have a clue what he was talking about like you just you, you know you i didn't know anything about vitamin d then i was quite naive to it and i just knew that we needed to take it didn't know much about it and the rapid test because he he worked in laboratories he was in he was in ivd diagnostics his whole background's around diagnosis diagnosis mostly like you know anything from like you know genetics through to um through to vitamin d and supplementations and like immune function and he, he basically said that the laboratory testing was excellent but the problem was the vitamin d levels fluctuate between 10 to 30 percent daily so they're constantly fluctuating. So you could test at nine o'clock and then you could test at 10, 11 o'clock and your vitamin D is fluctuated. And the reason being is because not many people realize, but every like the vitamin D has a half-life. So calcitriol, the active form, has a half-life of eight hours. Calcifediol, which is the vitamin D product, has a half-life of 15 days. And cold wow. calciferol has a half-life of 60 days. So after that, it starts depleting. So you know this kind of argument of, oh, I had sunshine in the summer and I'm fine? Doesn't make sense. Like, it, it, that's out the window because we know the half-lives now. So he said, if you could rapidly test someone and get their results, you could accurately get their results on that spot there. And don't get me wrong, laboratory testing is brilliant and it's very useful and still I would still recommend it because mm. you know, rapid vitamin D testing is just one angle. But what it does is that you finger prick the person, get a small like 10 microliters of blood, run it through our system, and it gives you the exact nanogram per milliliter and exact nanomole per liter. 
But the thing was, when you got the results, you were thinking, what the hell does this even mean? Because it's just results. You just tell you what it is. Mm. So Lars went with the vitamin D council and they started looking at the calculations and working out how to optimize your levels. And they built the, the vitamin D chart. You can you can get it from us. Well, you know, we can send it out. I'll send it to you, Alex. You can share it part of the podcast. Okay. And what, what they did is the the they looked at the levels and they said, if I'm at, let's say, 10 10 uh, nanomoles per liter or you know how do i get to 50 how do i get to 100 how do i get to 150 and then they looked at body weight and that's when that that figure came out you need 10,000 rus of vitamin d per 70 kilo of body weight to push your blood level up by one nanogram per milliliter or 2.5 nanomoles and so they said like 10,000 because they realized that if you go in the sun 10,000 IU for 10 minutes, that's a daily dose. That pushes that level up. And then as the half-life goes in, it goes down. So you're kind of filling it up whilst it's going down, filling it up. And so they then looked at that calculation and, and they realized that there was a calculator you could build from it. And then that calculator came around. Now, I won't explain the calculator but it, it, it too much, but it basically, it gets your tested level, your target level, works that figure out and then it divides your body weight by 70 kilos you times those two together and you get how many i use of vitamin d you need to get to your target and obviously your your half-life not, is not coming into control of that but it means that you could say to a, 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 a client or even yourself and say right i need 400,000 I use that doesn't mean you go and stab yourself with 400,000 I use it, it you know your body only has, has so much capacity that it can convert what you need to do is you take 10,000 every single day for 40 days and you've hit your target you'll be not if not here you'll be close to it and when we when we brought that calculation out oh my god Alex the feedback my friend the feedback we've had from people because they've actually looked at the calculator used it and they're going oh my god like one one guy said to me he goes dilly i've had chronic hip pain gone he goes chronic wow. hip pain gone um we had four police officers who did a part of a rapid vitamin d test all four of them jokingly started taking vitamin d whole of the precinct got 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 the uh, cold flu virus during christmas those four nothing and they couldn't believe it one of them said to me he goes my wife is so angry because i told her to take vitamin d she didn't take it and he goes she got the uh, cold i didn't get it and i was like it and that just blew my mind i was like yes we're on to something here mm, that is really interesting and as you know you raise a good point around the vitamin d research around pain as well i guess that's another um key thing for people to be mindful of ultimately as well yeah i think the vitamin d uh, research is changing that climate around it i think you know i think dr john campbell who's on youtube i think he does a lot of talk of talks about you know vitamin d and he's sat and sat down with all like the various vitamin d like icons in the industry and i know like a lot of them are like saying oh it's a conspiracy oh it's a conspiracy like you know and i know like a lot some of them are saying like you know you need to understand it and i do get that i see where they're coming from i've read through a lot of their research and a lot of their data and what and what they're looking at and i think vitamin d is now being looked at with a lot of scrutiny because mm. we know that it's got a lot of benefits and dare i use the word the c word and i don't just mean like you know, cancer, I mean, COVID as well, like both of them are playing major roles in it. You know, you look at Dr. Tina Pierce, she talks about using vitamin D optimization with part of her long COVID protocols. And the thing is, there's so much research and data coming out now on vitamin D because there's a keen interest in it because we've realized that in the 1928s when those results came out, it was kind of like lambasted, but we also need to look at the effects. And and then someone said to me the other day, I think it's the um, Scientific Association, uh, SACN, I've got the Scientific Advisory Committee of Nutrition, and they've got like their minimum levels that they set. And like, there's a couple of people like, oh, it's a conspiracy. They're, you, they're doing, they're like purposely keeping the vitamin D levels down because they want to make more people sick. And that's not the case. The problem that they have is, is that you've got a person who's got taking a source from the sun, you don't know if they've gone on holiday, they're eating, they're eating food with, with vitamin D and then supplementing, and then they're taking multivits with vitamin D in. They have so many sources of vitamin D. You know, we don't know what the safety of recommendate recommend daily allowance actually is. And when you kind of look at the RDA, they've kind of ascertained that like you need to have 4,000 IUs at the bare minimum, but that's because they don't, they're not using testing. But when you bring in testing into it and you test your vitamin D levels, 
you can then ascertain, right, this person has is this much deficient by and they need to get to this level or this person's levels are really too high and they need to stop taking vitamin d for x amount of days and then start supplementing again and i think that you know like i've said to a lot of the committees i've said to them listen you need to change your vitamin d you know charts and everything but the way you need to do it is to say to people get tested mm. that's it simple. get tested yeah it's, 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 literally, it's literally that simple, isn't it? And like, and I, I know the question you're going to ask me is, Dilly, how often should we test, right? <laughs> yeah. Every three months. Every three months. Like every three months, you should do a vitamin D test. Like you should be testing every three months to know where you're at and where you need to go. But I guarantee you, and I will bet my last bottom pound on it, that if you optimize your vitamin D levels, you will feel the difference quickly. Yeah. And I guess a question that comes up around the testing is, is there, based on what you've shared, is there an argument that we really want to be testing at the same time of day when we're retesting? Or no, would it still just oscillate independent of that anyway? Oscillating independent of that. It's, it's okay. still, you know, it's still going to like oscillate, I think. And okay. it's still going to change. But like, I think one of the scariest things I found with vitamin D is this kind of upper level limit. And like talking about um, toxicity levels. Now, like Alex, how long have you been clinician for now? Uh, <laughs> a lifetime. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, and have you ever come across someone with vitamin D toxicity? Uh, no, there is one case that comes to mind, but it wasn't ultimately. Okay, cool. So, the case that you're talking about, the case that I, I always ask this question at like like lectures and talks and I've asked this before. I say to people, like, give me your case of toxicity. And and people kind of like, go, oh, yeah, I heard, I heard. And I'm like, no, I want to know. Give me the person who got toxic levels. And by the way, this is a shout out to anyone. If you've got someone with toxic levels, can you send them over to me? I want to know. I want to personally test their vitamin D levels and see what the toxic level is. So I've been through the toxic levels. I've like gone through the clinical trials and the clinical trials that are like, I spoke about a lot is that there's one from Vith, one from Equaru and one from Jones. And there's another, another one from India. And I looked at the studies that they were talking about and each of these studies have been misquoted. And I don't know why they've been misquoted, but they said in all pa all the papers, and I'll send them to you, like, just do, you, do your own research, like, I've done mine, so I want you to, you know, if you've got a question about it, I'll send you the research, have a read through. And they said that the toxic level of vitamin D is 750 nanomoles to 500 nanomoles. Now, just think about that, 750 to 500 nanomoles, right? And we're told 50 nanomoles is where you need to get to to optimize le levels of vitamin D, right? That's a big, big difference. That's like a factor of 10 off, right? And so they said, for safety, you should have your vitamin D levels at 250 nanomoles. That's a toxic level. That's where you go above toxicity. And they did that because they wanted to be, they wanted to have safety in, in, in the numbers. They said, if we get to 500, because we'd never push someone to 500 to 750 we don't know the effects of someone you know it could be like they get really toxic they get really unwell their bones start like their muscles start cramping we just don't know so they said for safety let's get people to 250 nanomoles and i read the study and i was just like are you kidding me like are you actually taking the mick like these guys have actually t turned around and they're looking at the vitamin d levels and they're saying that it's a lot you know like lot higher than it needs to be so why the hell is everyone saying it needs to be 50 nanomoles i still don't know the answer that's one answer i've never got i've asked every single person i've asked the the um different authorities i've asked nutritional therapists i've asked vitamin d doctors and everyone just kind of goes i don't know hmm. but these are the papers these are the papers that you're quoting so why is it set differently and that that really that question really bugs me quite a lot and if anyone's got the answer please do send it over to me but i kind of feel like even the vitamin d levels need to be reflected because the human body is changing so much and vitamin d toxicity needs to be looked at and scrutinized under a different light i think and i think quoting papers from the 1990s and 2000s though though powerful times have changed 
our, our level of science has changed. I think we need to now look, establish that the upper level limit is much more higher because our genetics and our bodies have changed so much. I, I don't know what your opinion on that is. I'm not sure. I, have, I must admit, vitamin D is not something I've done a deep dive in. It's kind of on my list this year to uh, to look into more. Um, and I think everything you've shared today is just another reason why it's important, as you just said there, to kind of to do your research. Um, I think there's so much to be said around either data getting lost because sometimes it's just old. You know, you've been talking about practices from the 20s in the UK, for example. Um so yeah, I'm just I'm absorbing it all, Dilly. Processing. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse the pun, right? Excuse the pun. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think like it is. I think the the our understanding of the science has now changed, and there's so many like you've got doctors coming up on Instagram who are like becoming nutritionally aware and becoming FM practitioners, and I think which is just absolutely incredible. Like, what a time to live in. Like what a time, what a time, what like hats off to the people that are looking at nutrition in a different, you know, understanding it and absorbing it in. But what I always laugh about is like, I don't know, I've got friends who aren't nutritionally trained and they'll say stuff like, oh, I got my vitamin D today, I ate some eggs. Oh, I got my vitamin D today, I had some steak. And I'm like, oh my God, like you do realize an egg has about 80 IUs of vitamin D. And I've just told you that 10,000 is like a daily dose. What makes you think eating two eggs or one egg is going to like hit your vitamin D levels? It's not even even close to it. And so like I, you know, I just always say to people that I, I'll encourage them, you know, quite rightly that you need to kind of test on yourself a little bit more as well. And like even when, even when my partner, when she was pregnant, you know, we were looking at her vitamin D levels and she's an NT. So like, you know, we, she read the papers and I kind of said to her like, oh, there's like a professor in stamp in 1977 did the research on pregnancy and vitamin D. And he said that a pregnant woman should be consuming anything between 10, 20 to 30,000 IUs per day. Wow. 1977, he said that. 1977, he said that. And that was, um, like said they like lambast like, that date was there and he actually did that trial i think on 400 uh 400 expecting women if i remember the study correctly so that's quite a lot of a lot of people like normally we get away with doing 10 or 12 people but he did like he was a uh, he was um he did that on 400 people and i showed it to showed it to t and i was like what do you think of this and she went through and she went huh maybe i should up my levels i'll be up to levels to see what we did we tested her we went through it and my daughter, Rivi, like she's she's done fantastically. Her growth is on on par. Everything's on track. So, and we tested Tracy's vitamin D levels, and they're at like I think like seventy nanograms per milliliter, which is about one hundred and so that's seventy times. My math is awful. About one hundred and sixty, one hundred and sixty-five nanomoles, bit per bit there. Okay. And if I if you tell someone that, they're like, oh, your vitamin D levels are too high. Mm. Like, do you know your vitamin D levels, Alex? Not at the moment. I think it was it was probably autumn when I last did a test, actually. Okay. Um, but they were I always forget the units, but it was it was just over a hundred, whatever the unit is. Okay, cool. Yeah, which is which is good. Like that's like a really good level of vitamin D. But I think uh, Dr. John Roberts, one of my one of my friends, he summed up to me, he sent me an email on New Year's. He said, Dilly, this year we're gonna push our blood levels above 250. I'm like, yeah, cool, let's do it. <laughs> I said, let's do it. Let's let's just let's just go to town and kind of do it. And I think if you if you if you are serious about health, and everyone who's listening to this is definitely about health, I would say get tested, send us the vitamin D levels, and we'll work, we'll do the calculate together, and we'll optimize your levels. And I think we should be able to talk about it more and say what your symptoms are. And I think I guarantee you, people will come back going, "Huh, I'm happier. Oh, I feel really good. Oh." My muscles are not hurting as much. Oh, I'm not getting getting ill ill as much. Guarantee you the feedback is going to be absolutely amazing. What do you reckon, Alex? I'm up for it. Yeah. I mean, we can definitely share a link in the show notes and in the in the description of the video on our YouTube page and and uh, give people that opportunity to reach out to you, Dilly, for sure. Um with the the rapid test, is that is that available to anyone? Is it a sort of a practitioner device or how can people access it? So firstly, it's Balin's approved. Yes, Balin's okay. approved it. We went through that uh, rigmarole of getting the the IBD across them and showing them the registration documents and getting their approval. And they're happy to ensure practitioners on it. 
And so um, it's available on a website. You just kind of like you purchase the vitamin D device. And once you purchase it, we we basically you get the kit. And when you receive the kit, you send the team an email and they go, right, we'll book you in for a one-on-one -on -one training. And it's all one-on-one. -on -one. We don't do, like, we, we can do group trainings, but I prefer one-on-one. -on -one so it gets a bit of a question and answer with the person. And then we teach them how to use the, the vitamin D testing machine. It's the most easiest thing. It's complicated when you look at it from the start, but once you do a test, you're like, oh my God, I can do these for, for jokes. Right. And so we train you up you then we then fill in a form and it says is this person trained off like it, you know like the normal like jumping through everything yeah and you do the training module very easy and then i send you a certificate which says you're an official vitamin d, d tester and then you just start testing you can bring up balins and say will you insure me on this and they'll go yep no problem at all and it's literally as simple as that and you just start testing people test test people for uh, anything we're trying to uh change the the government legislation on vitamin d testing to bring it into gp practices at the moment as well like we're doing oh, wow. working hard to try and change it like the the i'm very fortunate that i've met a lot of like medical professionals in in the industry and who supported it and a lot of dentists and like some of these dentists like there's a couple of dentists in london wow like one of them said to me he goes dilly i will not let anyone have a an ex tooth extraction like you know the the was it the crown we put the crown into is it yeah crown is it he said i will not do anything unless you're and i so i test your blood levels and they're above 115 animals he goes i will not touch you he goes but if i get your vitamin d levels to that he goes i have a 99.9999 percent success rate and he goes i have no issues and the patient feedback is brilliant he's actually one of my best customers like literally just buys our test strips because he tries to test every single patient and he just he built it into the cost of the, the practice because he was just like it's so important for dental health mm. that's really interesting i love the i love when you can get those kind of anecdotal bits of evidence and the experience of practitioners because in some ways that's it's such valuable information um so that's super interesting and i think you know the 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 oral microbiome sort of space is obviously exploding. So connect that with the vitamin D and you've got some really interesting data coming out. Yeah, I'd like oral microbiome, blimey, we could do another podcast on that. Like we spent, I don't know how many euros on developing our toothpaste. And yeah, the oral microbiome is just absolutely fascinating. And I think, you know, you know, brings on to that topic of inflammation, talking about inflammation, we've seen before. And I think a lot of people don't, I say to a lot of like the average Joe, though, I say, you do know your, your gut starts in your mouth. That's your first, that's your first point of everything. Your mouth is yeah. what your whole body subjects itself to, because when you chew, the enzymes are releasing your mouth and the nutrients are absorbed. It's the reason why we create those liposomal supplements underneath the tongue. But if you've got poor oral hygiene, or your gut is very inflamed, you can tell by the person's mouth and their, you know, what's going on, the inflamed inflammation there. And that then goes in, goes further down. And I think T said to me this said to me yesterday, and I like, you know, you don't think about something, and you just like, she kind of like gave me an aha moment. She went, Well, if you've got gut issues, you should always start with the mouth because you need to start from the top-down approach, not from a bottom-up approach. I was like, I've been working in the microbiome area for like two, three years now. And I still, I didn't even think of that. I was like, of course, you start with the mouth first. Genius, like, you know, the idea of it. And I think that's, you know, you, you hit the nail on the head there. The mouth is the starting point of it, then into the stomach, dealing with what's up there, because that's the first point of digestion. And so if that's not digested up there properly, what do you think is going to happen to the intestines and the colon? Yeah. We had Dr. Horolak on the podcast last year and his... He has a PhD student who, who, and they both did a paper looking at SIBO testing and yeah. the impact of rinsing the mouth before taking your breath samples. And they found that um, at least a subset of those participants had a, a different outcome, i.e. a different diagnosis based on whether actually they were rinsing that oral microbiome or not. So, I mean, it can even impact, you know, breath testing from that perspective. It's really interesting. That's, I'm not surprised by that one bit. Mm. I'm not surprised by that one bit. I think like, you know, going off, are we okay to go off the topic of vitamin D? Like yeah, to go yeah, to the microbiome. So like looking at the microbiome. So, you know, I've been doing work with um, Sunny from, from Flore, the Sun Genomics guys. And cause they do the whole genome metagenomic sequencing and looking into that. And I think they, the data 
the things with the microbiome is that we just don't understand it. Like, even though we understand it, we don't understand it. Like, we literally just don't understand it. Like, we think we do, but, like, I think breath testing and all that, the SIBO side of things, that that market in the next five years is just going to completely change because they're showing now that if you can hack the gut microbiome, I don't like to use the word hack. So I think that just sounds like you're just trying to like, you're just messing around with it. But I think if you can optimize the gut in a specific way, you can, you can actually change the way your overall health is. And I know like everyone's piping on about acromantia municipala which is like the, the go-to thing now. Oh God, Alex, I found someone who spent 90 pounds a month on an acromantia supplement. It, it blew my mind. Yeah, I know. I've um I've had many conversations with clients and customers about this because I think it's now a bit cheaper, but you know, I've, I've been pleading for, with people for whatever, I think it came out to the market about two years ago now, maybe. And yeah, 90 pounds for 30 capsules of a single strain probiotic and you got to question. You got to question what sort of the motive is behind all of this. Um, but yeah, I should I give you a cheat trick? Should I give, huh? you, should I give you a trick? Should I give to give everyone a, a little thing? So when we did the research in Acromantia municipala, when I was looking at the data for it, if um, you, do you know where they get the, the Acromantia from? No. Okay, so it's going to be the simplest thing, and you're going to kick yourself when you find out where it's from. It's from pomegranates. Oh, it's actually from pomegranates. It's from pomegranates. So pomegranates have, oh, I forgot what the chemical is now. Sorry. You know, normally I'd read up on these things before, like we, yeah, we yeah. talked, so I just remember, like, jog my memory. But basically they extract it from, from pomegranate and because it has a certain a certain cell in there that works, increase acromantia. If you go to the gym, if you're working out, if you're going for a long walk and you're, you know, got an empty stomach, come home. The first thing that you do is eat some pomegranate you will increase your acromantia. And we, when we did gut testing and we looked at gut testing and we looked at it, people who were eating pomegranate, we actually saw that acromantia was actually at a very good level because you don't want to increase your acromantia too much because it would degrade yeah. the intestinal lining and you will get a leaky gut. So you've got to be really careful with it. Hence why they say, you know, have a, a range of, of a diet, but it's from pomegranate. So if you want to sort of circumvent the supplementation, you can eat pomegranates. When you say it's from pomegranate, are you meaning that, because I understand, I know from Dr. Horolak, people often talk about pomegranates as kind of, it has a polyphenol that helps feed acomansia. But are you saying that the acomansia probiotic actually had come from it? The one that I saw did. It okay. was like a French company, I think it was. I think it was oh. a French company. And that like, I did just the, the person told me and I looked into it and I was like, that's from pomegranates. And then, it, it kind of clicked when I was talking to another doctor who will not, I will, I will not name because they will kill me. And because <laughs> they were telling me that when they go for a jog, they come home. And when we did their acromancy test, it was really, really, they had really, really good levels. They were like 8% and then 11%. And they said that when they got home, they would get into the shower naked and open up a pomegranate and start eating it in the shower because they because pomegranate stains everything and they they jog my memory onto it and then I asked a microbiologist and and Sonny was saying about it and they were like oh we'll look into a bit more and then I started doing the research into it and reading up about pomegranates so don't quote me on it but that's what I remember remember reading but I think that we can do a topic about it afterwards but yeah pomegranates was just like it blew my mind a little bit and I've I've tried it myself when, um, when I'm training. I'll come back and I'll drink like pomegranate juice or have some pomegranate mm. seeds. And I always find that like, I didn't like, it wasn't a case of like losing weight, but I felt more defined, if you know what I mean. And like, you, you felt okay. a lot better. So that's why like, I know there's a link there, but maybe I'll do some more research and we'll do another podcast by it. Yeah, I think, it, I mean, it's a really interesting one. I think um, because, you know, it can make up five, seven percent of the overall microbiome. So it's obviously a really abundant organism within that ecosystem. And I know there is a study in humans where they were supplementing the probiotic acromantia and there was some there was improvement in certain cardiometabolic parameters like insulin sensitivity, I think, was one of them they were looking at. But I'm always a little bit resistant when looking at this sort of thing where we're talking about you know one one bacteria yes it makes up a relatively large proportion compared to a lot of other bacteria but i don't have any i have i don't have any acomans in my ecosystem never will unless i supplement with a probiotic ultimately um but it's not 
I think sometimes it can be easy to jump onto that and say, okay, well, that's why I've got issues with cardiometabolic disease, or that's why I'm struggling to lose weight or be lean. Um, but on average, we've got what 170 ish, hopefully other species of bacteria in that large intestine. So it's that, I think it's that tricky one where it's really fascinating and it's so interesting to go and look at the research, but we also have to rein it in and think, well, okay, I don't have any, it's not the end of the world. So I can probably get by without it. Um, and I think that's where what you were saying, Diddy, around do we fully understand it? Because it's likely that there's gonna be an, other organisms with a similar genome that are able to have the same function within the system. And I think that's something that we're gonna see a lot more of probably over the next year or more is helping people understand that, you know, when we talk about the microbiome, most of the time we're talking about the microbiota, we're not yeah. talking about the microbiome. Yeah, I, I, you, yeah, yeah I, there's nothing that needs to be added to that. Cause I think, you know, it's it's changing it's constant it's constantly changing and like mm -hmm. i can't stress enough i always say to the like you know any clinician that's testing is test again once you've mm -hmm. tested test again don't and like i think i really think like every patient that walks through your door they should know that when they're committing to you that they're committing to at least two or three tests or four tests because they need to be tested because the thing is we can we can ascertain what's going on not only by symptoms but symptoms are only one part of it and i like honestly the labs that are like you know like fortunate that, that the uk is like we've got like people like regenerous and people like um Genova in you know in our midst that like can do off this testing and and let's say the best one health path in our <laughs> midst that are actually testing people like the fact that you guys are able to test people and you're able to look at them from one perspective and to the second perspective is so important and like you know even with the vitamin d like the same thing being mm. able to test people for one path to go to the next bit like you know as that health path goes let's be honest like you've got like a link there and i think like it should be we should be testing testing is key to everything uh, because it means we can see where we are where we're going and where we need to go just yeah. imagine doing something blindly what well, you're not gonna you're not gonna get any you're not gonna get anywhere you can you'll get results but you're only gonna get so many results because you need to know like do i need to switch the person from this probiotic do i need to turn this person on to this supplement do i need to give them this supplement and i think when you look at it like that and you explain it to people they're like oh yeah yeah, that's very true because you go to a GP and you get your medication, but your GP, you come in and say, doc, it's not working. Their response is to increase the medication to get it to work. That's a response that they've been given because they don't have time. They don't have time to deal with people. They they have like a 10 minute window on my on my podcast with them, um, not podcast, sorry, my YouTube with uh, Dr. Tina Pierce, I was speaking to her about it. And Tina said to me, she goes, Dilly, we've had like patients come in uh, where their doctor has said to them, you have 10 minutes and you can tell me one symptom, one symptom, and that's all I'm going to help you with. So you imagine someone with uh, like histamine overload or, you know, they come in and you've got uh, multiple symptoms that are always fluctuating and changing. And you tell them one symptom, then you just give them famotidine or you give them cetrazine hydrochloride. It's not, you're not going to get a result from it. And like, I think now, like the, the nutrition landscape is changing so much and you're going to see some, I think we're going to see so much happen in the next 10 years with the nutrition industry where you're going to see doctors who will become nutritionally trained. I guarantee you'll see that. I guarantee it because now we know that if we want people to live not longer, because living longer doesn't matter doesn't mean jack all living healthier that's the key isn't it? it's not living longer it's living healthier and i think that's going to change so much yeah absolutely and i'm so glad you brought up the concept of you know the the retest because it's definitely something i'm a lot more conscious of these days when working with clients that you know if we're doing a test that actually clinically i often do find the repeat tests more helpful. Um, I mean, I do a lot of work clinically with sort of mold and mycotoxins now. So using that as a specific example, that second mycotoxin test can be much more helpful than the first and sometimes give you a much better indication of someone's total body burden. Um, but as you say, that retest in a different area of health is always going to, it's like your North Star. It allows you to know, okay, this is the direction that we now need to go in. Um, so yes, thank you for raising that important point. Um, uh, yeah. 
bringing it back to vitamin D because I'm just mindful of time. Um, is there is there anything that we haven't covered yet, Dilly, that you want to cover in regards to it? Not really. I don't think there's there's not really anything to add to it then other than take it daily. Like take it, like get it into your system, take it daily. I don't give a monkeys if you're going on the holiday to like you know tenerife or the bahamas and you're going to get sunshine for two weeks yeah no problem at all great but take it daily doesn't does it doesn't matter because like i said think about the half-lives think about like the fact that your half-life is going to be going down after 60 days that vitamin d from the sunshine which is cold calciferol has gone down know that after 15 days whether you're taking vitamin d and you're having it for, you know, the, the, the 15 days, it's gone down. If it's cow's trial after eight hours, it's going down. Like, just be conscious of that. Because mm. if you're able to be conscious of it and you're testing, you will know when and how much to take it. And the thing is, it's so easy to remember. Just go, oh, in the morning, a couple of vitamin D tablets. Because, you know, it can you can use it alongside medication. There's no issues at all. And you will feel the benefits. But obviously, you know, I have your things like K2 and magnesium, you know, they are, they are beneficial. The K2 argument, I'm a bit on the fence about, I've been reading into it a little bit more. The magnesium one, great, like 100%. If you are not having a magnesium bath every day, sorry, every week, like you need to, like jump in. I know you can't because we're, we're parents and we spend most of our time <laughs> chasing after, after kids. But uh, yeah, like I, I couldn't say it enough, like, you know, make sure you're having your magnesium, make sure you look at K2, have a little bit more on here and there and just, you know, look after yourself. And I think, doing something so simple can have so many health benefits because where vitamin D is part of our natural body. We need, we need the sunshine. We need it. Yeah, absolutely. Diddy, thank you so much for sharing all of your experience, your insights, everything you've learned recently around sort of vitamin D. Um, it's always a pleasure to listen to you talk. Um, we'll add links to everything you've mentioned in the show notes. So people will be able to check all of this out in more detail if they want to um is there anything you'd like to conclude with apart no. from take it every day <laughs> no alex i really i really appreciate the opportunity to talk about vitamin d it's one of my favorite topics and you know alongside histamine just love it absolutely love it and yeah please um if you do join us on our youtube i put a lot of content on there our instagram which is the nuva healthcare and i'm starting up a tiktok page and doing a lot of talk about nice. different parts of aspects of it and i think i just want to keep pushing this information out there and working with people like yourself like-minded people who are just here to like offer these little snippets of interesting knowledge so thank you once again alex for having me no my pleasure and we'll we'll do it again soon cheers